So good afternoon, everyone, um, dear colleagues, dear students. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to uh, introduce our speaker, Dr. Jocelyn Eichrich. Um, Dr. Eichrich is going to talk to us about why are birds good indicator species across landscapes. Uh, Dr. Eichrich is research professor at the University of Idaho. She is Fulbright scholar and visiting professor at the Ilya State University. Uh, I am looking very, very much forward very much for this presentation. So please welcome Dr. Jocelyn Eichrich. Please, stage is yours. Thank you, Zura. Let me uh, start sharing my screen here. Mm -hmm. And let's see. Here we go. As everybody's, does anybody not see that? Maybe I should say that. No. But, um, uh, well, thank you, Zura. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the opportunity to talk to everybody here. This is um, a great, uh, this should be uh, very interesting and fun for me. I've been here in Georgia now about uh, seven weeks and it's been a delightful time at, and I've been at, uh, teaching at Ilya State University and um, getting around and meeting a bunch of people as well. And um, I uh, was here 20 years ago. And so it's very interesting to compare what Georgia's like was like then, what I remember of it and what it's like today. And it's, it, I still uh, very much enjoy coming to Georgia. So today I wanna to talk about why birds are good uh, indicator species across landscapes. And I'm going to be. Uh, this is. I'm going to be using the state of the bird reports as a way to demonstrate this. And so it's very uh, focused on the U.S. and North America. And I'm going to be showing a lot of bird species from the U.S. And so if you have questions about any of them uh, at the end, do let me know. So let's get started. And I. This should take about. I think I'll get through most of it in about 30 to 40 minutes and so should have plenty of time for uh, questions and discussion. So let's start with talking about uh, birds as indicator species or what is an indicator species. So this is some information from the United Nations Environmental Program um, about qualities or characteristics of indicator species. But basically an indicator species is um, a species that can define a trait or characteristic about the environment. So basically a species that could delineate an ecoregion or could tell us something about pollution or climate change or species competition. So basically it's something, it's a species that can tell us something about what's going on in the environment. So I thought I'd first ask you guys, so why, why, what characteristics or qualities about birds make them good indicator species? So if you want to, put something in the chat or unmute yourselves and mention something, that would be great. Someone should speak up. You said that you, you would accept um, chat, no? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Are you so we were confused up? because two options. This two way options, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So question was what indicates birds as an indicator species? What makes them as an indicator, right? Which right, right. What qualities about them or characteristics about them? Yeah, maybe because of they have a, a special niche uh, or they are not, I mean, they are, they do not look like rats like, who, who are spread across the, um, in, in many environment or conditions or whatever. Yeah. So yeah. narrow anybody... specification might be indication. Of... Right. Does anybody want to add anything else? Go ahead, Sonar. Uh, birds are really susceptible to minor changes in the environment and food. Yep, yep, those are good things too. So uh, so you guys mentioned some of the things. Uh, so basically they're abundant and widespread in part because they are part of a numerous ecosystems, integral part of numerous ecosystems. And as Sonar just said, they are sensitive to environmental degradation. So they do uh, signal when something might be going, uh, uh, changing in an environment. 
but also they can respond quickly to conservation efforts. So basically we don't have to wait, you know, a lifetime, our lifetime to see potentially a change in our, our conservation actions. They also are indicators of human, uh, human quality of life, sort of the uh, canary in the coal mine sort of thing. You know, um, if birds disappear, um, you know, our quality of life goes on, goes down. Also, there's a tremendous amount of people that like to hunt birds as well as bird watch and so on. So um, that would be a detriment to our, our quality of life. And they're well known and appreciated. So there's a lot of people that really appreciate having birds in their backyards or being able to see them when they're out walking or anything like that. So that these are all reasons why they are good indicator species. So now I'm gonna give you an overview of the state of the birds reports. Um, and uh, basically they're a high level perspective on how uh, birds can be used to understand or how these, how these reports can basically report the condition of birds throughout the US. And I wanna stress that they're scientifically based, they're based on data that's been collected scientifically, but they are intended for a broad audience. So they're not written in a scientific manner, they're written in a way that um, policymakers, decision makers can understand what the science is. And every single one of them also has a call to action. So trying to say, what can we do to help conserve birds and what, and improve their conservation status and their environment. Um, so basically they, they if you um, get on the State of the Birds website, you'll see that there's lots of uh, pictures of birds and they, the reports themselves are these glossy things that you can give to policymakers and that they like to look at. There's not a lot of words. They try to really you know, be very um, succinct in what they say. Um, and I was also, so also they are initiated by the US Fish and Wildlife Service in the United States, and they're coordinated by the North American Bird Conservation Initiative. It's also called NABSI. And this is a group of government organizations such as the National Park Service, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, the USDA Forest Service, um, Bureau of Land Management, um, and then also private organizations such as the Nature Conservancy, National Audubon Society, and American Bird Conservancy, and then various bird initiatives. And it's a, it's a really unprecedented group of people that came together to do these State of the Birds reports. And each year that they did them, they had a different uh, group of scientists that were working on them. And I had a chance to work on a couple of them. This is a picture from the report, uh, with the 2011 report. So this is the science team that was uh, gathered for the 2011 report. And right in the center here is Ken Salazar, who was a secretary of the Department of Interior, fairly high politician, very high level politician. And he was asked to basically do a media event to release the report and talk about the results, to try to get some uh, real attention at a high level on these reports. And that's me right there. So I was able to be there and meet him and be there for the results, uh, the release of it, which was very interesting. So now I wanna get into the general methodology and the data that was used for these reports. Um, so basically all these reports use sort of the same sort of data and um, did different and tried to ask different questions about it. So there's, first of all, there's population trends. So there's the North American Breeding Bird Survey, which is uh, managed and coordinated by the US Geological Survey. And it's a, a volunteer uh, uh, survey. Volunteers across the US, including Alaska, go out and do breeding bird surveys once each year. And they've been doing it for about Oh, about the 1960s. So it's been about, uh, I guess that to be about 60 years now. There's also the Chris Fitz uh, Bird Count that's organized by the National Audubon Society. And then the US Fish and Wildlife Service, as well as the Canadian Wildlife Service, have been doing waterfowl breeding population and habitat surveys annually for many years. Then the predicted distributions that we have um, that we uh, created are based on eBird data, which I'll talk about in a minute. The public and private lands are from the Protected Areas Database of the US, which is managed by the US Geological Survey. And then the primary habitats are pulled from a national land cover database, actually two of them. One is, both of them are managed by the US Geological Survey. They're, each of them is a little bit different. So that's the main uh, data types that, um, that were used in the reports. So more specifically on the eBird data, um, so eBird is a citizen science project. It was started by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and um, basically, if you are out 
anywhere and you have uh, your eBird app on your phone and you see a bird, you can enter the bird identification, the time you saw it, and it records the location you saw it. And so that's all put into the eBird database. And um, that's what we're pulling from is that it's millions of records now. It, it started in about 2000 and it's been just growing exponentially over that time. And we pulled out what's called bird checklists. So basically that means that when someone went out to go look for birds, they wrote down every bird they saw as opposed to just whatever birds they wanted. They wrote down every single one they saw. So we pulled out those checklists. We also only used unique locations. So we didn't have repeated locations of birds. So this map shows a bunch of those locations across the US. This is not uh, like a, a current map. So I'm sure it's even more filled in. So the orange shows the places where eBirds uh, locations or birds have been seen by an eBird participant. And then the white areas indicates places where we don't have data yet. So what we did to get to the predicted distribution that we used is we took these maps of, for each bird species, so these maps that show locations of where a specific bird was seen. And we used, we modeled predicted occupancy based on a variety of variables here. And basically we came up with this predicted occupancy here. And the brighter the area indicates a higher probability of occurrence. So these very bright areas here indicate high probability of occurrence. And this is during the breeding season. Um, and so each map, once it was uh, uh, produced for each species, was evaluated by experts at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. So that's how we came up with the bird distributions. So we focused on uh, bird, uh, uh, species that are habitat obligates. And the habitat obligates are birds that require a specific kind of habitat. And for example, here's the greater sage grouse. It requires sagebrush to uh, survive. And sagebrush is part of the arid lands uh, primary habitat that's right here. So this is based on the USGS, US Geological Survey's National Gap Analysis Program land cover, which is shown here. And it's grouped by the primary habitats that we were interested in. So just to orient you a little bit, um, this kind of, I don't know, peachy color, I guess it is, is the arid lands. This darker green is our Western forests. This kind of brown here is our, um, uh, what is that? That's the uh, ag lands. And then this darker brown is the grasslands. And then this lighter green over on the Eastern part of the US is um, our Eastern forest. And then Alaska has a bunch of of tundra areas and so on. So these are our major or primary habitats is what they were called that we used in the analysis. So as I said, the, the state of the birds report started in 2009. The first one was basically trying to look at the distribution of birds or the trend of birds across the United States and call attention to the current state of birds. So <clears throat> we they used population diggers for birds in each major habitat. That includes 67 endangered threatened species and 184 species of conservation concern. So species of conservation concern in the United States are species that have been declining for their population has been declining for many years, but they're not considered threatened or endangered, but they are of concern. So this uh, graph here has the habitat types across the x-axis and the percent of species in each one of those. And so you can see the Hawaiian ones have the most threatened or federally threatened and endangered species. And, but each one of these habitat types does have some threatened and endangered species. And of course you can see like um, even uh, the Arctic and um, I have to move my little thing here. Um, the oceanic have like almost 40% almost of their uh, species that occur there are species of conservation concern. Oh, come on, Let's see, there we go. Um, so we, in that report, the population trends were also looked at for these four uh, groups of birds. And so it looked at over this time period, starting with 1968, what was the change in the population from what it was in 1968? So the percent change. Wetland birds went up, um, and this reflects a lot of, of success on the conservation of wetlands in that, in that group of birds. It also reflects that there was a tremendous increase in geese during this time. So that's what's included in this group here. But you can see that grassland birds here, uh, they declined by 40% over the, those 40 years. And then arid lands, which are these light blue here, they declined by 30%. And then the forests, 
they decline and they've leveled out some, but they're still below what they were in 1968. So moving on to the birds for um, the state of the birds for 2010, this is where uh, the threats to birds were looked at, specifically climate change. And um, so there were five characteristics for birds that were classified as whether they were highly vulnerable to um, climate change, moderately, or just had low vulnerability. So the five characteristics, first one was migration status. So if they were long distance migrants, they were considered highly sensitive to climate change. Um, for uh, the, If they were uh, the breeding, uh, breeding bird obligate was also the next characteristic. If they were very highly uh, specific in where they needed to breed, they were considered highly vulnerable to climate change. If their dispersal ability was poor, they were considered uh, a high vulnerable, highly vulnerable to climate change. Uh, if their niche specificity was highly specialized, again, they were considered highly vulnerable to climate change. And lastly, their reproductive potential. So those bird species that can only produce one to two young per year were considered highly vulnerable to climate change. So again, we have our our major habitat types across the x-axis and percent of species in each one. So you can see the oceanic and Hawaiian birds are have a lot of the high vulnerability, which is the red. And I would guess this is because of their very specific niches and their long distance migrants, or at least the oceanic birds are. Hawaiian birds have very specific niches. And so I think that's probably why so many of them have a high vulnerability. But you can look at, see that many of them have uh, birds of high vulnerability. The only one that doesn't is the grassland birds. This report also looked at shifts in bird ranges northward. So it used the Christmas bird, Christmas bird counts that are organized by the National Audubon Society. And over all the species, there was a, uh, on average, um, over those 40 years, a 35 mile shift northwards. And this is mostly attributed to many, several warm winters that occurred during this period. Um, they're also the forest birds alone shifted over 50 miles. Um, let's see. Um, they, they used data from 1960 to 2006. They included 170 birds in this analysis and 56% of them showed a northward shift over that period. So then moving on to the state of the birds, the 2011, this um, was the first time that the birds, distribution of birds were assessed on public lands and waters in the US. And so there are over 850 million acres of public lands, which is about uh, greater than 344 million hectares, if I did my conversions correctly, and 3.5 million square miles, which equates to about 9 billion hectares of uh, public lands in the US. And there's about 800 species that occur on these public lands. And of those 800 species, over 300 of them have at least 50% of their distribution on public lands and waters. So it really highlights the importance of these public lands and waters to bird conservation. So down here, there's a graph showing the major habitat types and the percentage of ownership of each one of those. So Arctic and Alpine have over 80% public ownership. So does boreal forest. But as you go down, there's um, the grassland birds have the least amount of public ownership. Um, and eastern forests as well. So this is um, what we did. I explained how we came up with the uh, predicted bird distributions and we laid those on top of this public land ownership map. And this is based on the protected areas database of the US. It's maintained by the US Geological Survey and includes both federal and state agencies. And so um, let's see the brown here is the Bureau of Land Management. The dark green is a USDA Forest Service. This yellow is the National Park Service. Uh, and the blue is US Fish and Wildlife Service. The green, I'm sorry, the orange is uh, Department of Defense. And then I think the last one is this pink, which is uh, state land. So that's spread across the entire US. But you can see in looking at this map that they're, the public lands are very biased to the Western US. <clears throat> So yes, here, just, just quick question. When you mention public lands, it means uh, agricultural lands? No, or it means it, it could include agricultural lands. It's basically lands that are managed by any one of these agencies that I just mentioned. So they're held in public 
ownership uh, for the public and they uh, they're open to anybody to go there as long as there isn't you know some sub level of protection for a species or oh, something okay like that. which are not okay. private yeah, yeah they're not private no nope. yeah but the point was why they need like how they use so okay thank you yeah and each one of these agencies manage them differently like the national park service they have a much higher level of protection than the Bureau of Land Management and the US Forest Service. So this was, we were able to do in this report, we were able to basically look at those uh, major primary habitats and then the percent distribution of birds on each in each one of those and then divide them up by each one of the agencies. So it basically highlights the shared stewardship responsibility across all of these agencies for each primary habitat. So for example, uh, Arctic and Alpine, this is the Bureau of Land Management. So a large percentage of, of, of birds in Arctic Alpine occur on Bureau of Land Management lands. And this is the US Fish and Wildlife Service. A large percent of those occur on Fish and Wildlife Service as well. Over here on the Mexican pine oak and Western forest, a large proportion of those for, uh, birds occur on Forest Service land. Um, but one of the things that I think is interesting is this pink because it cuts across all the major habitats. And that's because that's state lands. And because those state lands are covered across the entire US, unlike the public lands that were sort of biased towards the West, it covers all the different habitat types. And so state lands, state agencies do have stewardship across all these habitats for the birds that occur there. So one of the things that we could do with this data, this, we didn't, this didn't go into the report, but for each one of the birds that was included in that report, we can look at their predicted distribution, how much of it occurs on public land, and what agencies have the, the uh, stewardship responsibility for those birds. So for example, the mountain bluebird here, 59% of its range is predicted to occur on public lands. And most of that is on uh, forest service lands, as well as BLM lands, and some on state land. So if, if any sort of conservation action is is needed for the bluebird. These are all the agencies that would need to collaborate to basically have a conservation action that would uh, impact this bird across its entire range. We can also look at it by primary habitat. So here um, is the arid lands as an example. 56% of the arid lands are, that occur in the US are publicly managed. And for example, the Gunnison sage grouse, which is a candidate for listing on the Endangered Species Act, or on, on the Endangered Species List, which is part of the Endangered Species Act, because, and 79% of its distribution is on public lands. So basically, if we wanted to conserve this species and keep it from becoming listed on the Endangered Species List, there could be a lot of action, conservation action done on public lands to help the species. So this pie chart here, shows that 51% of the air land birds uh, have distributions on public lands. And this is how they're split out among those public lands. So most of it is on BLM, but some of it is on uh, Bureau of Land Management, some of it's on Forest Service, and some of it's on state agency. Again, like I said, if there was conservation actions for air land birds, like specifically Gunnison sage grouse, these are the agencies that would need to collaborate to do that. So then they, um, because the State of the Birds report in 2011, um, it got a lot of attention and there were a lot of people interested in the results. And so instead of doing a report for 2012, uh, we skipped 2012 and there was a lot of implementation and uh, application of our data from the public lands report to try to conserve species on public lands. So then it related to 2013, to do basically the same sort of analysis, but now do it on private lands. And so basically, again, this was the first assessment of bird distributions on private lands um, across the US. And we looked at private protected as well as other private lands. So this is that same map I showed you before. Now all the public lands are, are in gray, the light green are private lands, and then the dark green are private protected lands. Um, and so what this, um, let's see, let me look at my numbers here about, um, let's see, uh, there's about 1.43 billion acres of land that's held by private uh, individuals. And that's about 578 million hectares. 
And this is held, is privately owned by millions of individuals, families, organizations, and corporations. Um, and that's about 60% of the entire US. And of that, so looking at all the green in this, in this map, the dark green is the private protected. That only is about 24 million acres, which is about 97 million hectares, which is actually privately protected. And the way it's privately protected is through organizations like the Nature Conservancy or through land trusts that have conservation easements on these uh, private lands. So what's the contribution of private lands to, to bird conservation? So what we found was over 100 bird species have at least 50% of their breeding distribution on private lands. And if you remember what the uh, public lands graph looked like that was similar to this, grasslands were way at the right side, but now they're right here in the middle because most of grasslands fall on public lands, over 80% of them. And then, um, but then we have the, the forests over here that not very many of them uh, uh, fall on private lands. So basically it's the birds that are occurring in these primary habitats is where the most conservation impact could be on private lands. So for example, uh, there are 358 million acres of grasslands in the US and 85% of those acres are uh, privately owned. And there's 29 grassland birds that, uh, uh, that these grasslands are important habitat for. And one of the things that occurs on these grasslands is a lot of cattle grazing. And in some ways it's, it's a helpful because it provides a mosaic of these grasslands. These grasslands are used to being grazed. And grasslands also provide wetland buffers that improve wild, uh, water quality and watershed health for human uh, communities. So think about um, minimizing flood impacts and stuff like that. That's the sort of things that grasslands can do. So here's a pie chart that shows the distribution of birds uh, on grasslands. So about 80, uh, one percent of birds occur on private land, and less than one percent of grassland birds occur on private protected land. So there's not very much private protected land. So again, this is the area if we want to impact grassland birds. And as you've seen in some of the previous reports, grassland birds are some of the bird, groups of birds that are going down in population. So this is the biggest opportunity for trying to conserve those birds is on this private land. And one of the biggest ways that that's done is through this. Uh, program we have in the United States called the Farm Bill Program. Um, and as I said, 82% of grassland bird distribution is on private lands. There's 27 million acres that's in the Conservation Reserve Program, which is part of the Farm Bill. And what the Conservation Reserve Program does is basically it pays farmers not to farm. So every many farmers have part of their land that's not very productive. And so it doesn't really they don't make enough money off of it to really put the money into it, their uh, expenses into it to get to farm it. So what the federal government is asking is asking them to give them some money to grow native plants there to help uh, these uh, grassland species. And one of the species that's really benefited from this is the Henslow sparrow. So you can see when the spring bird counts were started uh, back in the 1970s, they weren't doing very well and they kept going down. Then when the uh, Conservation Reserve Program was initiated, the, this population just started growing. And, I, and it was because of this Conservation Reserve Program, there was these uh, native habitats out there they were able to take advantage of. So the Farm Bill is about the conservation programs part of it. It's about $24 billion. And that amount of money dwarfs any other conservation funding combined in the United States. But and it's renewed every five years. The farm bill is renewed every year. So every five years, it's renegotiated what will be included in it. And in recent years, about uh, of that 24 million, uh, 24 billion, about 3 billion has been cut in about in recent years. So that does impact what can be done for conservation in on private land. So then moving on to the state of birds in 2014, basically this was going back and revisiting what was done in 2009 and looking at population trends. So we had a few more years of data to add to it. So it went from, we used the breeding bird survey data from 1968 to 2013. And it was also the 100th anniversary of Martha's death. Can anyone tell me who Martha is? Who is Martha before we start to use Google? <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody know who Martha is? It's passenger pigeon, the last one. Yeah. Yes. It's so what? 
passenger pigeon. It was she oh. was the last religious passenger pigeon. Passenger pigeon. So it was named as Martha. Or not? Yeah, because there was only one wow. of them. So. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah, she died uh, in a uh, hundred years ago in 2014. So it was uh, 1914. She died, and so that her death was the extinction of the passenger pigeon, and it was a really remarkable because this was a species that numbered in the billions before it went extinct. Um, and so um, we're, this was sort of trying to have the message of what we've learned from the extinction of the passenger pigeon. So again, looking at these uh, five habitat types here and what their percent change in population over this 1968 to 2013, you can see that the uh, wetland birds were doing okay, coming back up. But again, grassland birds, airline birds, and we were able to actually uh, split out eastern forests from western forests because we had enough data there. And they're both kind of uh, still uh, lower than their 1968 um, populations. We can also look at the change that we saw since the 2009 report. So it shows uh, that the airland birds um, are, sh are showing the steepest decline as our eastern and western forests. And grassland birds, even though they're lower than their 1968 population, they are showing a little bit of increase. This is probably about, oh, 3% or so. And then, of course, the coast and wetland birds, because of very of major um, conservation efforts in wetlands, are um, have been doing well, both the coast and wetland birds. So, so the change is positive there. So then in 2016, Decide, they decided to expand beyond just US and then do all of North America. So they included Canada, US and Mexico, and they focused on what's considered a watch list species. And these are species that are at risk for extinction. They looked at 1,154 species total and 37% of them or 432 of them are most at risk of extinction and less significant action is taken to try to conserve them. And as I mentioned, it's across all North America. They use these habitat types. So we've got the boreal forest up here. We've got the tundra up here. This is all the temperate forest in the light green. Right down the middle of the US is the grasslands and then the arid lands in this uh, lighter color over here. And then down in Mexico, we've got the tropical forest down there. So they looked at the birds in each one of these habitats. And this is where each bird uh, breeds. So um, they also have generalists down here at the bottom. Those are for the species that don't have a specific habit. They can uh, breed in uh, different habitats. And so they put them into a, they lumped them all into this generalist category. But as you can see, over 50% of the ocean birds and the tropical forest birds are considered high concern on the watch list. But all of these uh, habitat types have uh, birds within that high concern area. So lots of uh, work to be done if we want to try to conserve these uh, watch list birds. So then coming to the uh, state of the birds in 2017, um, this comes back to the farm bird farm bill. This is a special report specifically on the farm bill. So I'll tell you a little bit more about the farm bill. So the, for birds, uh, the farm bill will secure as important habitat for over 100 bird species. And as I said before, it's the largest source of funding for habitat conservation on private lands in the United States. And for landowners, um, it provides financial support for uh, ecosystem services, such as clean water, and it keeps uh, working lands working. Meaning if you're running a farm, it helps you maintain and keep running that farm with uh, these programs. So this isn't, uh, a graph showing what, so each one of these, this is our wetland birds here. We have our various different groups of birds. And so in, um, so from 1968, you could see all of these groups of birds were declining. In 1990, the wetland easement was added to the farm bill. So this was one of the years that the farm bill was renegotiated and this was added to it. And since that time, wetland birds have increased. And in fact, they've increased by about 51% there. Um, and that it looks like it almost, based on this graph, it can look like it can be attributed to wetlands easements. Now the forest birds uh, in 1990, they added the forestry title 
and they haven't rebounded as much, but there is some increase and they do, there's a, about a 3% increase of those birds. And then the grassland birds, so in 1985, sorry, uh, the Conservation Reserve Program was started, which I mentioned before, but unfortunately that didn't seem to help the grassland birds much. So in 2003, the grassland easements was added to the farm bill and grassland birds have at least stopped declining and have shown about a 3% increase since that was uh, started. So this is just a demonstration of how much the farm bill has helped bird conservation on private lands. So the last day of the birds report that I was gonna talk about is the one from 2019. It is based on a paper from Science by Rosenberg et al in 2019. And they looked at the decline of abundance of birds since 1970 to the present day. And they found steep declines in many birds. So here's a few of them. Forest birds showed a 22% decline. Shorebirds showed a 37% decline. And grassland birds, uh, as we've been talking about, have been uh, declining and they showed a 53% decline. These declines um, seem to be most often in common and well-known birds, some of which are shown here, like uh, uh, Eastern Meadowlark, the bank swallow and the dark-eyed juncle. And so 15 of these common species account for over 67% of the total loss of native birds over this about 50 year period. So for example, the dark-eyed junco, for us, this is a very common species. It's very common for us to see it in our backyard, but you can see just how many have been lost since 1970. It about, looks like about 170 million of them. Even though they are still quite common, they were even more common before. So what's killing all these birds? So this report by Loss et al. in 2015 shows that on an annual basis, cats, free roaming cats, feral cats, are killing 2.6 billion birds per year. And this is in the United, this is in North America. So this is in the US and Canada. Uh, birds hitting windows uh, tribute, uh, about, uh, contribute about 624 million losses of birds. Vehicles uh, contribute about 214 million. And industrial uh, 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 collisions are like collisions with um, uh, wind turbines as well as electrocution on power plant or uh, power poles that contributes about 64 million. So these are the ma major causes of mortality of birds. So I don't want to leave you thinking that all is lost and every bird is is uh, is of a conservation concern. So there are some conservation successes. Um, Raptor populations, because of the ban of DDT in the United States and Canada, have rebounded by about 200% since about 1970. And one of the most remarkable uh, recoveries is the bald eagle, which is, uh, our, is the national bird in the US. And in 1970, there were a few hundred pairs of them. And by uh, uh, now, there's about over 30,000 pairs. And so in 2007, they were actually uh, removed, the bald eagle was removed from the endangered species uh, list. And this is a current distribution of birds across, of bald eagles across North America. So you can see it's quite a wide distribution. The other uh, group of species that's doing well is the waterfowl. They have increased 56% since 1970. And they really, this group of birds is really a model for how we can reverse bird com uh, declines and by doing habitat protection and restoration. Two major uh, legislation things that, that uh, provide funding for that help waterfowl is the migratory bird stamp and then also the North American Wetland Conservation Act. And so both of those have provided a lot of funding to try to, to protect wetlands and has helped waterfowl over the last 50 years. And this is um, a map of the wood duck and where it occur currently occurs across North America. So I just wanna emphasize that these reports are a very valuable communication tool. It, they compile and leverage a large amount of scientific data from national databases, such as the Breeding Bird Atlas, I'm sorry, Breeding Bird Survey, uh, eBird, the Protect Areas Database, the National Land Cover Database, and these are all national databases that are available across the web and you can download them. And these are all, many of these are based on inventory and monitoring programs that have been going on for 40 or 50 years. And this kind of data really helps us prioritize and plan management strategies across the US. And it, uh, these reports 
are great for communicating the need for additional resources for protection of birds and their habitats. And as I mentioned before, they're typically released, there's a big media event and they're released by the Department of Interior of the Secretary or the Secretary of the US Department of Agriculture. And so getting that kind of level of person releasing the reports and getting this big media event gets a lot of attention from policymakers and decision makers and really helps uh, uh, people think about bird conservation, how we can improve it. So to circle back to this whole thing about birds as indicator species, I hope in talking about these state of the bird reports, you've seen, I've uh, demonstrated how they can be used as an indicator species across landscapes because they're widespread globally and they occur in numerous ecosystems, which I mentioned before. They eat a variety of food, which was mentioned before. They um, occur, have a broad range of niche requirements. They're e easily observed. Many of them are easily observed, not all of them. But all of this leads to very detailed life history information and also long-term population data to be able to track these populations over time and across large landscapes like the entire US as well as North America. So these data are invaluable and help us um, inform conservation at the level of landscapes. And lastly, they are big business. So in the United States in 2016, the US or, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service did this survey and found that there are uh, 2.4 million bird hunters that spend about $2.3 billion per year on bird hunting. But then the bird watchers, about 45 million of them across the US, spend about 7 billion. And a lot of this is on wild bird food as well as watching birds. So there's a lot of money that's generated from having birds around. So they're important not only uh, to ecologically, but economically. So that's, uh, I just wanted to end by saying that the State of the Birds reports, again, were a big uh, collaboration. And here's many of the agencies that were included, as well as the organizations that were included in some of these State of the Birds reports. And it was a, um, that's a big collaboration to bring a lot of this data together and, and, and form and create these State of the Birds reports that hopefully inform conservation. So thanks for your attention. Uh, thank you, Jocelyn, very much. Uh, thank you, Jocelyn. Mm -hmm. I would like to uh, open question and answer uh, part of our uh, presentation. So please, if anybody has a question, uh, could you please raise a hand and then I'll, uh, I'll go yes. so, you know, through the questions. Yes, but on the uh, yes, uh, Jocelyn, my question is uh, specific. So it's like, what struck me that actually uh, among the reasons of bird deaths, the uh, factor of cats or windows are incomparably higher than all industrial, you know, effects, mm -hmm. and um, this somehow actually forces me to. Uh, review uh, the view, the general view on the, you know, on the ecology and on the influence of industry and buildings and things like this on ecosystems and on a wildlife. So it's like a, uh, is this really a broadly understood by conservationists and I don't know, like a ecological activists and people like this. So my question is this. Yeah, so actually a lot of research has been done on um, mortality of birds by cats. Peter Mara at the Smithsonian Institute has done a lot of that work. And it's, uh, it's difficult to gather that kind of information because, um, you know, he, he somehow has to figure out how many cats there are, especially feral cats, and how many birds they're eating. So there's some there's sometimes a lot of uncertainty in their numbers, but they are getting better at getting them. They're actually putting cameras on cats and you know watching them, be able to watch to, when they are out roaming around. You know how many birds they take and stuff like that. And um, and then as far as the windows, they are there's a lot of initiatives to try to get tall buildings in cities to turn off their lights, particularly at night, um, so that there isn't that, that, that light that uh, attracts birds. And then have, have the buildings have uh, use glass that doesn't have such a reflective uh, 
as much reflectance so that the birds aren't going thinking that they're going through something as opposed to hitting something. And so they go around them and stuff. So there is a lot of initiatives to try to reduce this. But the issue with the cats is that, um, you know, these are pets. Cats are pets. And so people don't want to be um, told how to handle their pets. And um, even I've read research that even the bells that uh, cats have, those don't really help because a cat learn how to stalk without having the bell make a noise and stuff. So, um, so yeah, so that's, there is a lot of research that sort of supports this. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, I believe in this. So, but I mean, a, what is actually interesting for me, it looks like it is a huge loss of birds by different reasons, including cats windows and so on. And birds are the most of the species are still there, you know, in spite of loss like a 10 billions every year. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this respect, actually, you know, it appears to me that just making a lot of activities around like forbidding a um, uh, wind generators or other reasons of industrial effect on bird uh, um, uh, and, uh, and other, in other industrial effects on bird number um, looks not very highly effective, you know, because it's a only a small portion or among the reasons of bird death, and it doesn't look like these uh, industrial influences are really able to significantly affect the bird number, except maybe some rare species. So. Yeah, yeah, that's that, that's a good point. There is um, some efforts in the U.S. to when the birds when there's big uh, numbers of birds migrating, there's an effort to try to not have some of those wind turbines going, so that the birds can travel through during that time, so that they're not at risk of getting hit by the turbines. So there's a lot of collaboration between the energy uh, sector and the conservationists to try to figure that out. So that might be part of the reason that those numbers are lower. Um, but of course, as you know, those wind turbines are put in windy places because that's the best place to gather the wind energy. But it's also those are the places that birds use, you know, ridgelines and, you know, places where the wind is going, where they can, you know, travel long distances in a short time. So sometimes both of those are overlapping. So we have to figure out temporarily if there's a way to uh, have them not be impacted so much. Right. Thank but yes. You. You have a valid point there that that the industrial stuff is not as causing as much mortality as some of these other things. Yeah. yeah thank you. Yeah, and also I would add there that uh, to um, to answer a little bit of Dato's question, that uh, cats are not only contributed to the to the uh, to the uh, bird mortality, but even more actually they are contributing to the small mammal mortality there is oh, a research yeah. Yeah, that's, that's and uh, even more actually twice more numbers are actually for the small members than mammals than, um, than for the uh, for the birds also in other places like in australia and the oceanic islands they contribute even worse that they yeah, cause they it's kind of recorded that they cause some of the extinctions. No, no, I, I was striking not mm -hmm. so much about like cat influence, but a uh, relatively modest influence of integrated industrial effects. So that's that's the point. Yeah, and I remember that, uh, that and I remember that uh, when I was in Idaho. <laughs> Dr. Anderson's tiger was contributing few times actually to the <laughs> to the mortality of few birds. <laughs> okay, yes. uh, next was Mari and then um, Ben Swanner. Please, Mari. Uh, Jocelyn, I have just um, two questions. So this application with uh, um, with which you can monitor birds, um, how it can be avoided that some birds are really colorful or notable birds and people are, and bird watchers can guess it easily and some of them can be noticed uh, like hardly. So those numbers might not um, uh, describe the reality when it is used to analyze the data. This is my first question. And second one is that 
Uh, what is the um, um, statistics or trend for game species across um, whole um, in US, for example, are people change their attitude, less hunters are coming or um, if, if you have data, of course. So your first question about uh, monitoring the species, that's a, a very valid point. Um, the eBird data, um, so there's eBird folks, citizen, citizen scientists out there that are expert bird uh, watchers. And so, and a lot of those actually, those people actually contribute an awful lot of those bird sightings. Um, Cause they like to go out and look for birds and they like to record them and they like to know which ones they've seen. And so they record all that. So there are some real experts out there that will identify those hard to known birds, hard to identify birds. But um, your point is valid that some birds are not easily observed. They're just more secretive. And so there's, mm -hmm. they aren't necessarily, these survey types aren't necessarily seeing them. So the citizen science with the eBird as well as the breeding bird surveys. The breeding bird surveys are relying on seeing them as well as hearing them. So that's why they do it during the breeding season. They're listening for those birds. So they don't necessarily have to see them, but they can identify them by ear. So those birds that are maybe a little less uh, uh, visible can be identified by their songs. And the volunteers that do these breeding bird surveys are um, supposed to be able to identify all the birds that they would see on the report. There is a lot of work with the breeding bird survey data to look at those observer biases and try to eliminate that. And that's the same with the eBird. So those are very valid points, but it's on the tail end of getting that data that those biases are tried to be minimized and so on. So, um, and then your second question was about the game birds. So as I mentioned, the waterfowl are the ones that are the, doing the best as far as all those groups yeah, because of, of wetlands. And so those are our still, those are birds that are being hunted too. And so they're still doing well. Um, and so, uh, because there's a tremendous amount of, of duck hunting that's done in the United States um, and also goose hunting. Um, also other game birds such as wild turkeys, they've been increasing as well. So some of those game birds are doing pretty well and that could be, so when you have uh, in the United States, when you buy a hunting license or when you buy hunting gear, you buy a rifle, you buy ammo, you buy a hunting goat camouflage, some percentage of the sale of that goes to uh, waterfowl conservation. And so it comes back around to help do conservation for waterfowl. So that's part of a, a model that actually we've been trying to, uh, the US I should say, has been trying to uh, replicate for non-game birds to try to get more funding for non-game because this, this model with the waterfowl and the wetlands birds has worked so well. And there's, uh, so when they, and then when they buy a license, which is that migratory bird stamp uh, uh, I mentioned, when they buy a license, a portion of that also goes back to conservation. So th those birds um, have a lot of money coming in to help uh, preserve their habitat as well as the species themselves. And so I would, I would add to that, that the, uh, as um, Jocelyn mentioned, uh, uh, to kind of point out a little bit more that uh, management of the uh, of the game birds in you know in the United States is one of the most uh, one of the best actually management systems so they're doing very well with the managing uh, the populations for uh, considering the hunting so that's why there there's a I mean wet wetland waterfall management uh, is like um, kind of ideal type of there's lots of uh, science involved in there and uh, lots of um, uh, lots of actions actually to to make sure that the populations are not declining and actually increasing opposite to that they're increasing so that's I, th I think that's very important point there well and and Zora I would mention we learned our lesson in the United States because we did uh, have un unregulated hunting and we drove those populations way down about 100, 120 years ago and then started having more of this sort of regulations and this funding and that's when those populations came back. So, Indeed, so we yes. learned our lesson. <laughs> yeah. Please, Sonar, and then Dr. Anderson. Uh, okay, thank you, Jocelyn, for the presentation. It was mind-opening for me. It was very good. I will check the references. And my first question is related to like Mari's uh, point. It was very important, I think, because 
uh, I also contributed this uh, community size uh, databases for 10 years. It was Bird Bank in Turkey, but now changed to uh, eBird, like uh, you have in the United States. Uh, for the last five years, eBird in Turkey. And after that, I realized that, like Mary said, uh, yes, there are experienced board, boarders in Turkey, in the United States, many, many, in UK, many, many, but not many, actually, we can say, because it is even really hard to recognize the birds and they, from their sounds. And another thing I realized is, even I see myself kind of good birder, good ornithologist, uh, unintentionally in the field, you hear the one that you like, and you note it down. So for the common birds, and for example, agricultural birds, most of the birders do not note it down. And after this kind of applications, like from, for example, from I, iPad, they, now they are putting, I didn't try it for the last six years, and I just quit taking note. I'm, I didn't uh, quit the taking notes, but I don't use these applications. After these applications also, you know, you feel that you should be fast on the point because it, the coordinates also goes. And probably most of the birders do not take the common birds. And agricultural birds, they just uh, take the notes of the like, good looking birds or the birds they most know or like, or the rare species only. So, yes, this breeding bird counts may be contribute to this da database and it will increase the uh, precision of the data. And probably the bird bandings can be more effective to, uh, bird ringing can be more effective to, con uh, the, to know the habitat trend, uh, not bird trends, like population trends or the diverse trends, but community size can be, I don't know, yes, in the United States, it is long for the 40 years, 50 years, uh, you do, uh, but I don't know how the effective, and about the uh, success, you say success of the wetland conservation, like wetland birth increases. Maybe not the success, but the excess, access to the wetlands can be effective, because the more the bird watchers and ornithologists, the more birds are noted. So, yeah, you said there are some articles about these biases, to get rid of these biases, but I realized that even good birders, ornithologists, go to the field at the same time. For example, I and my professor was going to the field at the same time, with the same methodology, but the number of birds which I hear or counted was sometimes double. Maybe I'm not uh, going to know the methodology rightly because for me, like 50 meters is maybe I cannot realize. So even the best ontologists in Turkey, for the Turkey, I say, uh, there is a bias for the observer in the observer. So I can ask the other questions maybe later. Well, and just in response to your, your comment, um, so the, the, the folks at the Cornell Lab of Orthology are very aware of the biases that, could, yeah. that are potentially in the data. And they're constantly trying to figure out how to minimize that bias. One of the things they started, so the eBird started about in 2000. And one of the first things they started doing when people would submit um, identifications, they had expert birders you know, that knew kind of where bird, certain bird species should be. And if a bird was observed outside where it would be, they contacted that person and said, can you describe it? Can you, you know, and so, it, and so there was a, a second level of verification there to make sure. Now, since that number of, of observations in eBirds has gone up exponentially, they don't have people doing that anymore. They've tried to use artificial intelligence to try to sort through a lot of that and eliminate mm -hmm. ones. Also, because everyone has their phone, has a camera on their phone, people are taking pictures. So that's another way to verify that that actual species is seen there. Um, and um, so they, and I, so yeah, I, I, I can't 
speak to all the things they're doing to eliminate the bias, but they're readily aware of it. And they are constantly trying to work out ways to figure out ways to make sure that the bias is as minimized as possible. And the birds that, you know, like a lot of these eBird folks go on to eBird, look for places where birds have not been seen and go there, or they go to their favorite places and they, you know, look for all the birds there because they can identify all of them and put them in there. So they, these birders who, when you go down eBird, you'll see some of these birders, you know, they go out every day and they see hundreds of birds. They're trying to improve the database by doing things that they love to do. So they know how invaluable the database is too. So. But yeah, you can't eliminate all the bias. No, there's no way to do it, but you try to minimize it the best you can. Okay, Dr. Anderson. Yeah, um, so of the three large groups that um, you showed the demographic trends for, grassland bird species seem to be the ones who were responding most slowly, although the last couple of years it looked like they were increasing. So is that due to habitat destruction or why are grassland birds uh, not responding? Do you know? Yep, it's habitat loss. Um, so the U.S. is blessed and cursed by the middle of the whole U.S. is grasslands and it has very fertile soil. And so most of that area has been turned up and turned into agriculture. It's what's called the breadbasket of the United States. And so a tremendous amount of agriculture is there and provides food for a lot of people in the United States, but that has uh, uh, contributed to habitat loss as well as habitat fragmentation for uh, many grassland birds. And so that's the biggest issue with the uh, grassland birds going down. And that was why one of the graphs I showed where the farm bill included uh, grassland, grassland easements. And that seemed to be showing that the grassland bird populations were at least leveling off, not coming back up, but leveling off. So I think by actually trying to preserve grasslands and potentially maybe restore some, that it's helping some of those grassland birds. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. Actually, adding to that, I have a question, and it's also about the grassland birds, and that's why I will just uh, say it here. Uh, I noticed that when you were showing about, uh, you know, influence of the climate change, uh, possible influence of the climate change on the different groups of the birds, uh, it actually looked like that most of them were moving uh, north, but only grassland birds were moving south, actually. Uh, I think it was a, in a, a little bit yeah. stuck, right? So what's, what, what it is related to? <laughs> you know, I don't think I can answer that question. I don't know. Um, I can postulate that maybe, um, you know, the, the warmer winters don't benefit them. And so they were moving south or maybe it's not winter. Maybe it's uh, higher uh, uh, spring and summer temperatures or uh, less precipitation. I'm just hypothesizing. I actually cannot say what the reason is for that. Oh. But I can try and look into it, Zora, okay. get back to you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And the second second thing was that, um, in terms of the uh, in terms of this bill, right, which you have for you know leaving out the farmland, uh, some some land actually on the on the privately owned farms for the wildlife, uh, mm -hmm. right, and it actually uh, not benefited very well the the grassland birds because maybe and it benefited the forest birds and other birds, right, yeah, you know, <clears throat> more kind of successfully, right, but it's, maybe it's because when you're doing farming, it is predominantly in this case, as you mentioned, it, it is wheat production and, you know, maize and these kind of things, right? So yep. there's those are grasslands by itself, right? And then if you leave some land alone and not put the weeds in there, then it's going to be, you know, forest grow there or, I don't know, some shrubland or something like that, which automatically is not good for the, for the grassland birds by definition, so to speak, because those are yes. different. So that's yes. maybe in reality what you're doing with that, you're just re re reducing the, the habitat in the, rather than improve, improving the habitat for the grassland birds. Yeah. You know what and I mean, right? you understand? One of the things with, as I mentioned, the farm bill is renewed every five years and the conservation reserve program, which is under that, which is the ones that pays farmers to not farm, um, that had a 10 year limit on it initially. They changed it to 25 years later because um, that 
you know, for a farmer, you know, it, the ec economy, the economy or the economics of the land is the bottom line. So if they can make money off their land, they'll farm it. But, you know, what they're being paid from the conservation reserve program is not as much as they would be uh, earning if they farmed it. So when the um, commodity prices, the crop prices, selling crop prices goes up, they want to farm everything, whether, no matter how productive it is. So that, because every little bit, that's a, a better for their bottom line economically than to put in conservation reserve. So a lot of these places that were set aside in conservation reserve program were then tilled up. You know, all this wonderful native grassland was tilled up again after the 10 years or the 20 years because the crop prices were so high. And so the farmers wanted their land back to uh, be able to farm and make more money than they were making with conservation reserve program. And I think that so the conservation reserve program was like the first thing that was tried in grasslands and then they tried it over on the forest side. So I think they learned the conservation, you know, uh, conservationists learned maybe better how to write the policy to have it have a longer term impact. Um, so okay. I think that's partly why you see the grassland birds not coming up so much, but just sort of, you know, maybe going back down because of this short term window that the conservation reserve program actually operated in. So. Okay. Thank you. Nika, you had the question or was that what it means? <laughs> um, I'm just, I just wanted to say that, um, so I, I wanted to listen to this lecture and I could not because I had another call. And uh, when I joined again, uh, there was a talk about uh, the importance of uh, eBird and all this data, how they uh, pro process this data and uh, everything. And uh, yeah, I just, um, it's just uh, very important for um, the research and if it's possible uh, i would be happy to see this recording of this lecture after the um, after it's finished so of course yes i will send the link to 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 the participants of the yeah. definitely <clears throat> okay thank you jenna you have a question yes uh jocelyn thank you very much for sharing your part of your work. Um, it was inspiring also for me. And my interest is also um, about the grasslands. Mm -hmm. uh, so is there any uh, shift from the bird population from grassland uh, to any other habitats? Because uh, you show that um, uh, the, the bird population in grasslands, uh, they don't have high vulnerability to climate change. Is there any study uh, about it? Like, um, you know, I'm not sure if I can answer that question very well. Um, I recognize that the the state of the birds reports were focused on habitat obligates, so they were specifically looking at birds that relied on grasslands or relied on arid lands and so on. So not so much um, going back and forth between them. But there has been some research that I've seen that shows that birds can adapt and move into other areas. But then the question becomes, is that a, a, a potential uh, sink to their population? Is it a, a place they're going because there's no other place for them to nest, but they're not able to successfully nest there. So it's actually leading to a population sink. So I think that's some of the research that maybe still needs to be done is if there are some birds moving to other habitats, can they actually successfully reproduce and have a positive impact on the population? Thank you. Yeah. So but that's then, a very good question. I don't really know the exact answer to it, but it's a good question. Um, please, so let me hear it. Okay. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. My question is related to this bird deaths you discussed. Oh, you went on, you're on mute now. Yes, you're. Okay, my question is related to bird deaths, the effects, the causes of bird death. In the beginning, you discussed the effects of industry and collisions, and it seems somehow insignificant comparing to these cats and the other stuff. I think uh, it is wrong because uh, there is an invisible cause of these constructions. I worked in wind turbines for several years. I also go to coal 
uh, plant powers, hydroelectric powers, uh, like sun, like solar energy, power stations, everywhere, all kinds of places. And uh, for example, if you just say the effects of this uh, industry is low, then I can say that the number of birds and the species richness in this area, even in coal power stations, are very high, and the biodiversity in this area are very high. So these are very good habitat for birds. Can I say this? Um, uh, you can say it, but depends on what species are there. Are they species native species? Are they introduced species? Um, you know, are they the species that you actually want to be there? There are there are native species and the biodiversity, species richness and abundance in coal uh, thermic centrals are higher than the other central and lower in solar panel stations. This is fact, uh, comparing to natural areas. And but we cannot say that these are very important places, very good places for the birds, and the biodiversity is very high. So we should discuss the the definition of biodiversity, and if you want only the biodiversity in the area, the important thing is, I think, not only the biodiversity, but we, that we cannot see many effects, invisible causes there are. For example, what about the effects of these places to do illnesses, like, like maybe some birds have heart attack, weakness, like the quality of habitats decreasing, these are invisible, invisible values. We don't count these. These are, but effects, they are bad. So maybe the, because of this industrial stuff, the number of bird deaths are much, much higher than the cats. Like maybe 10 billion. Yeah, that's a legitimate point. It could be, yeah. I can't, I can't speak to it, but it, it, you're, you have a valid point. Okay, any, any other questions? Can I ask a question? Yes, of course. Since I'm still getting, you know, still learning about Georgia and everything that happens here, what, what, um, what agencies do you have here in Georgia that are equivalent to like our US Fish and Wildlife Service and our National Park Service and our Bureau of Land Management that potentially could work together, collaborate, like I talked about with Stay the Birds, to help conserve birds. Are there multiple agencies or is it one agency or how does it work here in Georgia? Yeah, I can answer the question. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, I would like to also um, um, point out one thing which kind of is more, gonna be more like a discussion because uh, I also noticed through your presentation that actually protected areas, your protected areas have not, not that much uh, actually is not covering that large uh, area maybe or something but there is no um, they are not kind of um, conserving too much birds so to speak in a way right, uh, right. and uh, and here in georgia we have a slightly different situation we have larger protected areas in terms of the i, I suspect in terms of the in the area, you know, um, compared to the area of the of the country generally, uh, and uh, that's also one of the agencies which is responsible in that sense, right? It makes uh, makes uh, their kind of around twenty percent of the whole territory, I think, uh, okay. so a little bit less maybe, uh, and <clears throat> and. Uh, 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 yeah, and then there is also Ministry of Agriculture, which is uh, responsible for the land, it's a certain type of land, mm, uh, and the forestry department, which is under the ministry again, and that's a department which is under the ministry. Uh, we do have the um, similar-ish type of agency, like um, in, in Fish and Wildlife, but it's it was created a couple of years ago, so it's starting to operate, but it's not kind of very much involved into the management yet. Uh, so, and then predominantly it's going to be Ministry of Economics, and uh, which is going to be, uh, which is going to be involved, because large number of the public land is owned by the Ministry of, uh, or managed by the Ministry of uh, uh, Finances, uh, oh, wow. and Economics and Finances, I think. 
so that, that's there are a few agencies obviously which are uh, which are involved in that. So agriculture, forestry, uh, protected areas, and the Ministry of Economics so is gonna are gonna be the ones which are um, which are gonna be predominantly responsible for the areas. Also, and local, of course, local public lands as well. I mean, locally okay. managed by the different regions. Is there is there much uh, collaboration between these? It sounds like some of them are all under the same ministry. So, is there much collaboration in trying to do any work, or maybe they uh, <coughs> maybe they all have enough resources to do the work they need to do? <laughs> Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm uh, nearly sure that the resources are not as much as necessary needs to be necessary. That's why we have lots of international funding coming in, um, and the, the, the lots of international organizations and funds who are working here in terms of the you know to to cover that that aspect, so to speak, because obviously Georgia is not that. So to speak, rich. Yeah, so, so they don't like. Ah, I think you guys are rich in natural resources. So <laughs> for sure. Yeah, yeah maybe. <laughs> maybe yes, but um, but yeah, that's. Uh, but the, the, there's some work done. There's some coordination, especially internally in the Ministry of um, Environment and uh, and um, uh, what's the name? Ministry of Environment and the. Uh, Agriculture. That's we have the same same ministries dealing with the environment and agriculture. Uh, that's going to be largest one. Who is um, who, and there the, are the lots of organizations which are the agencies which are in, included into under this uh, uh, included under this uh, ministry. And although I I'm nearly sure that majority of the land is still um, public um, land is still uh, under the management of uh, uh, economics ministry of economics so that's more difficult to talk to them because <laughs> <laughs> they have more their mind is more oriented on on yeah. making profit yeah. obviously rather than yeah. rather than protection of course yeah well in in the US um like the Bureau of Land Management and the US Forest Service both have mandates to manage their land as multiple use. So that includes extraction of minerals, forests, anything that oil, that sort of thing. So they can go in and do that sort of thing. Whereas the National Park Service and the US Fish and Wildlife Service, their mandate is more for protection. And so to ask, you know, like the Bureau of Land Management to work with the National Park Service is sometimes asking a lot because their mandates are very different. Their legal mandates are very different. So sometimes, even though it sounds great to have them collaborate, sometimes um, they they aren't able to collaborate in the same way because like Bureau of Land Management has to think about, is there, uh, should we be looking at energy development here? Should we be doing a timber harvest here? And doesn't all, you know, conservation is just one of their many uses. Whereas National Park Service, conservation really is their main uh, mandate. So it's, it uh, we have a lot of land, you know, that's in these agencies, but there's a lot of sometimes mismatches with what they can actually do. So. Yeah, yeah, indeed. yes, that's the similar situation here as well. Of course, there are different mandates and different goals, so to speak, right? right? So, and then sometimes they are conflicting to each other uh, <laughs> for the different ministries. <clears throat> but yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think we what we can do, we just finished right now assessment of the red list of Georgia. And okay. uh, we can do the similar type of research if I find the student for that. And we can map the distributions of the of those endangered versions of the birds which we have. Uh, and then actually try to figure out which particular um, which particular um, agency is responsible for the majority of the birds, and if the protected areas or uh, you know are covering uh, enough, uh, so to speak. Uh, and and you're population. well aware of gap analysis, so you know what that yeah. is shown in the U.S. So yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. So similar. Very interesting. Okay, everybody, anybody has any more questions? Okay, thank you, Jocelyn, very much for your presentation. Thank you for the opportunity, Zara. Very, very interesting. And um, we'll, you know, we'll see you in the spring, I suspect, right? Yes, I'll be back.
I'll be back. I'll be, I'll bring my husband. He's a biologist too. So he's going to ask lots of questions too. <laughs> this is going to be great. Yes. Right. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye, thank you very much. Bye-bye.